perfect. I think that's um, that's everyone joined us at the moment. It's nice to see a few uh, similar um, people that uh, joined us from across the week. Um, someone else has uh, raised their hand at the start, but we'll, we'll, if there's any questions, we'll, we'll get to them in a bit. Um, so, so thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Kieran Daly. I'm Head of Market Development at uh, Social Investment Scotland. Um, I'll just do the housekeeping just now before we go through introductions to people. Um, so um, we've got various speakers today. Um, if you are speaking about um, various different ways to raise investment, community shares models, um, and also we, we're joined with um, Creative Scotland. Um, so there are going to be spaces for questions um, throughout the session, which is going to be about an hour, an hour and, and a half today. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A box and also a chat, um, chat function. Um, either of them will do. If you want to ask some questions, I will take a note of them or field them in, and if we have ch a chance at various points, um, I'll put them to some of our panellists. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start kick, kicking off at the moment. So I'm just going to um, go around everyone that we have um, in the room and do some introductions. So I'll go firstly to um, to Dana, actually, if we can say hi there, Dana. Hello, um, Dana McPhee, broadcasting from Grimsey in North Uist in the sunny Outer Hebrides. <laughs> Absolutely. And you've got a great background uh, behind you also. <laughs> yes. Well, I thought if you're bored of looking at me, you can look at the stuff behind me. <laughs> so I need to get an interesting background behind me also. Um, and, uh, so we've got Morgan Petrie from um, Creative Scotland. Hi, Morgan. Afternoon. Um, yeah, um, Creative Industries Manager in the Creative Industries team at Creative Scotland. Um, I'm glad to be partnering. This is the final um, workshop as they were originally, but now webinars with Social Investment Scotland and Kieran and Community Shares Scotland and Toby. So, hello. Oh, yeah, I'd wait, we have Toby also. Um, so, hi, Toby. Yeah, hi, folks. I'm Toby Sanderson. I'm from Community Shares Scotland, and I'll be presenting later on what community shares are and, and how you might be able to use them for your own organisations. Fantastic. So if you've joined us at the start of the week, you would have um, been involved in the session with the Creative Entrepreneurs Club um, and uh, the, the support that they offer. And we also spoke about the range of investment of, um, opportunities that we offer. Um, yesterday we had Lindsay Leroy from Scottish Design Exchange and um, today we have uh, Dana McPhee and Toby from Community Share Scotland. But before we kick off there, just wants to hand over to uh, Morgan Petrie um, to um, give us a bit of an overview of where Creative Scotland are at the moment and um, some funding opportunities and um, an overview of their area of work. Um, if, you, if you would uh, say some words, please, Morgan. Thanks, that'd be great. thanks Kieran. Um, perhaps I'll, if I'll share my screen. And I think um, because there are, uh, I think, quite a few people who have been taking part in a number of the sessions. I'll rattle through this um, just to give a, a kind of description of where we've come from, where we are and where we might get to. So um, as many people know, we had three routes to funding, regular funding, 121 organisations, core, that's a, a longer three year and, and, and currently it may well be a four year cycle. Uh, open project funding and targeted funding. In March, we uh, were, like everybody, locked down and realised that many projects were going to be seriously hit. So we wrote to everybody to say, we obviously have to bring in uh, new criteria to assess applications. So we're going to have to bring in a risk assessment process. And if you feel that your project can't go forward, please withdraw and we'll assess what, what we can. Many people did withdraw and as we all saw, Festivals, events, theatre hit terribly badly and a number of applications did get through but we realised we had to change things very quickly. So we put together a bridging bursary uh, programme which we distributed over £4 million um, of bursaries up to £2,500 to 2,300 uh, applicants. That was done very quickly, light touch. Uh, it helped in that gap particularly, and it was focused on the self-employed, self sole traders. Um, and then we, uh, we focused our attention on our open project funding, which I'll come to at the end. Um, we do have targeted funding where 
we, if we see a, a, a strategic need, we can quickly put together a, a, a small call or work with partners like we're doing currently. Um, Create Networks Fund was in train um, and there were projects selected in March. And I, I thought it would be interesting to mention this because of the social enterprises and organizations interested in community shares. It's very much about grassroots activity. I think I'll mention, I mean, there's, there's the four currently running in Dumbarton. They are looking at networking, free to access, make space, creative spaces, resources, business support. There's a look again in Aberdeen that they are looking to stretch out their network and support model into Aberdeenshire, Orkney and Shetland. We've got a, there's an Inverclyde Council partnership with Creative Inverclyde and a, a network of six creative micro clusters around Argyll and Butte. Now, this is an area that I think we want to explore further and we, we are hoping and aiming to run something of this nature again, because I think that networks, local uh, support networks, business support, uh, looks like an area that is going to be of need for some time to come into the next year or two. Um, we did notice as well that lots of um, organizations, individuals, companies were trying to use digital tools and media to make sure that they were keeping communicate, you know, keep communicating with their audiences, with their customers, with their partners, with their stakeholders. Um, some are doing quite well, some are not using um, digital media as well as they might, and perhaps we felt that we could offer some support. So we've got uh, a digital pivot support program. The first cohort are up and running, but that will open again for applications. You can look on the Creative Scotland website. Uh, it'll be open from the 6th of the J July to the 20th of July. And while you're there, we're also going to be partnering with The Space, which is a digital development agency working with the BBC, Arts Council England, and with Creative Scotland for the last nine, 10 years even, that, that we're looking to put in place a peer support programme there. Uh, yesterday was the, the, the first webinar that coincided with our session yesterday for our partnership with Crowdfunder. And I'm aware that both Kieran and Toby have conversations and worked with Crowdfunder. This is our first project with Crowdfunder. Um, there are an, another two opportunities to engage with that on Friday the 19th of June and Tuesday the 23rd of June. Um, that's a kind of standard model where um, a grade, graded um, success rate for anybody getting onto the programme, launching on Crowdfunder and Creative Scotland will uh, match fund the, the money raised. I think that's an area, again, that we would like to work with partners on, to expand, to explore further. And this is the second time we've done a crowdfunding project. The first was a pilot, but I think this looks like a particularly interesting area to explore further. So core funding, um, uh, the open fund, uh, which is we redesigned um, and uh, it does what it says in the tin. That's our aim is to sustain creative development through this period of restrictions on, on movement and gathering. Um, we have um, re-emphasized equalities, diversity and inclusion. And that is uh, an area that um, was all, has always been part of our work and what we seek applicants to describe how they respond to that. And we have raised the importance uh, of that area in, in uh, our application. So we seek projects to articulate how they demonstrate um, their approach to equality, diversity and inclusion, and also uh, environment, not just carbon reduction, but um, sustainability and use of products, uh, waste management, anything like that, travel. Uh, we are, again, we have also re-articulated our need to, for projects to demonstrate public benefit. And we have also got a risk assessment process in there where we've laid out a simple um, approach, red, amber, green, that we ask applicants 
to take into consideration. So what's changed? We've reduced the maximum award to 50,000 projects. Used to be 24 months. We're now looking at 12 month projects. Um, applicants, uh, you can apply for up to 15,000. We'll turn around an application in eight weeks. Anything from 15,000 to 50,000 will turn around an application in 12 weeks. Also, we are assessing individuals uh, together and organisations together. Previously, it was just under 15 or over 15. Now we're um, looking to see how individuals compare against other individuals. So apples for apples. Um, we are, and I'm sure both uh, CIS and Community Shares are, are in constant conversation with the Scottish Government um, and through by find business support, working with our partners, and looking to see what we've missed, where we can bring other funding in on stream and tackle what looks like a serious challenge for the creative industries. So information on the website and more coming soon. And there's also um, a, a quite a valuable resource for on our website that points to many other funds as a number of organi other organizations are doing. I'll stop there and hand back to you, Kieran. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. That's fantastic. Um, so just going to move on to the next section, which is Community Share Scotland with Toby and uh, Dana. Hi, Toby. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. Um, and thank you for joining us, Dana. Um, you've, you've kindly agreed to kind of give a little bit of a, a case study experience um, as a sort of Q&A interview. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a, a few few questions and, and get some some light on, on what you've been doing. Um, and then I'll go into the, the detail on community shares and, and the support that Community Shares Scotland can offer. Um, so firstly, Dana, could you maybe just introduce US Wool and, and tell us a little bit about what you do and how it all started? Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, originally the, the idea, I cannot claim it as being my idea. Um, it came from uh, a friend of mine who lives in Grimsey, but who's originally from the United States. And it was a friend of hers who was visiting in the late, you know, I think it must have been about 2007, 2008. Um, and the friend from the States, her name was Libby Mills. She'd set up the Green Mountain Spinnery in Vermont. I can't believe the phone's just ringing. It's not all <laughs> typical, isn't it? Anyway. Um, an answering machine will come on, so this <laughs> ringing will stop shortly. Um, and anyway, long story short, when Libby saw how local wool was being wasted, in a sense, here, um, you know, people were burning it, people were binning it, people were discarding it. The value of it and the price of it had fallen so much that it just really wasn't worth people's while to, to do anything with it. So she thought there was a, a model that we could follow to establish a spinning mill in North Uist, in Grimsey, North Uist. And um, so that conversation started and a long period of feasibility study, research, visiting other mills, seeing whether or not it was a viable idea. So that period sort of took us up to about 2011. So we're all just doing it as volunteers at that stage. Um, but we officially established Uist Wool in 2011 after the, the period of research had been done. Then we realized, you know, that's great, you've established your name, but we didn't have a premises, we had no machinery, and we had no people. So the, the next phase was really to um, acquire funding for the mill, for building it, source yeah. machinery, and then obviously start a training program, because nobody here had the skill in built to, to run a mill. So that project took three to four years, really. Um, and that's a lot of funding. I think I tallied it up. And over the period from feasibility all the way through capital, blah, 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 it was almost just under a million pounds of fundraising in about a eight or nine year period. So um, really in 2000 and early 2017, we officially launched the trading arm of, of Uist Wool. Um, we have four members of staff now. I'm a volunteer director. Um, I had been the person involved in, in the grant funding and establishing US rule, but I sort of stepped back from the, the sort of the, the mill floor uh, back in um, 20, early 2018. 
um, just to, to give myself a wee bit of a break. Um, but I was still involved, obviously, as a, a volunteer and more actively so, I have to say, in the last <laughs> three months. Um, but that's, that's it in a nutshell, really. Um, yeah. Great. Um, you, you kind of touched a bit on it there about the role of sort of reducing waste and, and things like that. Could you say a little bit more about what, what the sort of social purpose of, of US rule is? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly um, there, I mean, I could wax on for hours about the beauty of native Scottish wool. Um, it's incredibly hard wearing. Um, it's, it's beautiful and it's, you know, <laughs> it's in its core. Um, I mean, we do have a heritage of wool working in the Outer Hebrides. It's yeah. still surviving today, obviously, in the Harris Tweed industry, which is, is focused really in the north of the Outer Hebrides in, in Lewis and Harris. Um, but we're still a mill, we can still obviously spin yarn for Harris Street production, but we decided to really focus on, on the knitting yarn yeah. and small batch um, natural blends. I mean, you can see the color palette behind me. We don't do any dyeing. We use natural blending in, in our kind of um, yarn design. Um, we do some spinning um, for commissions for weaving, you know, that we, we then commission weavers to work for us. Um, but I think with wool, you know, it grows every year. The sheep have to be sheared. Yeah. So in a way, it's a, it's a sustainable resource. It renews naturally. Um, and we try and find a purpose for local wool. I have to say the majority of native wool where we are, um, it's, it's, it's maybe too, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's very hard wearing, but it's not really designed for knitting yarn. So we had to go through a whole process of, grading wool and deciding what was good enough for putting into a knitting yarn. The majority of wool I have to say in Scotland and the UK goes to the carpet industry. Um, we're obviously not running a carpet <laughs> you know, mill. Um, we're, we're being quite selective about the wool we take but it's fantastic yeah. and um, you know it just we're, we're quite a small sector in the UK doing that kind of spinning. So um, we're slightly different in the way we do it from others, uh, but that's, that's good because then we're able to shape quite a unique market for, for our yarn. Yeah. So. Um, and I think we've got a pretty good clue to this question behind you, but is your, is your main source of income through selling wool and, and knitted yeah, uh, products? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we do, we've kind of, we really had to establish our own brand first. A lot of people inquired with us, individuals who want their, their wool spun but you know really we, we have to be kind of very selective about how we do spinning commissions for other people yeah. because it's going to be expensive um but for us we spin for our own brand newest wool um and also we have our own space here um the retail wool center in newest we trade online obviously directly to people we do some wholesale. We're just beginning to sort of expand that a little bit. And also, like I said, we do very select spinning commissions for individuals. It tends to be people who are then doing something with the wool, either as, as you know, cloth that then they're able to make into garments or some secondary product. Um, and we tend to partner up with people who are maybe going to advertise the fact they're using us. So it's more of a kind of collaborative yeah. partnership as opposed to just us just taking their own, spinning it and handing it out. Um, so there's three sections to it really now. So. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question from the chat there. Um, how close are you to capacity with, with the um, spinning yarn? Um, and is there much scope for larger production? Um, probably with capacity. I mean, you could run a mill 24 hours a day, every day of the week if you wanted, if you have the staff to do it. Um, obviously, we don't do that um, because we've got a small group of people and we're just literally at the beginning, beginning to emerge from that startup phase. So we have to be watching costs very clearly because we're not grant dependent. Um, and we were lucky to get some startup funding from Highlands and Islands Enterprise um, in 2017-18. In but, you know, since then, we've been sort of standing on our own two feet, you know, and it's tough. It's not with a new business, you're really trying to put your name out there. Um, so we could grow capacity if we then increase working hours for people. So um, at the moment, I think we're doing okay. We're covering ourselves. 
So I think there's still scope for a little increase. Um, you know, again, as I say, you can run machinery in shifts and a lot of mills, when they get busy, they do that. Whether we'll ever be at a stage where we're doing that would be lovely, but um, not quite there yet, I don't okay. think. <laughs> Great. Um, and so Uist Wool, or Friends of Uist Wool, is, is set up as a community benefit society. Um, and I'll be saying a little bit more about community benefit societies in my, in my presentation, but could you maybe say a little bit about what that means for you and, and why, why Uist Wool chose that model? You know, I was thinking about this because it was some time ago, I mean, it was back in 2009, 2010, we were looking at this and probably it had love changed since then. It was quite a new idea back then. We, we kind of used the cooperative model, you know, at the time cooperatives were more common or that was the, the word that seemed to sort of capture what we were planning on doing. And we just thought it was good to leave that option in um, as a, an idea for the future to offer community shares. So, so we just that's that's the real reason why. Um, I can't say we spent too much, you know, you no. know time thinking about <laughs> that. But it just seemed to fit the idea of that a small enterprise where mm -hmm. we're located. That at some point we might do that. And so that so that model means that you have sort of paid in members of your society. Am I right to say you have a, a few hundred members? Uh, when we when you say pay in, you know, well, for five yeah. pounds, which yeah. gives them a lifetime, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So yeah, the Friends of Used Wool was the member organisation, and I think when we were setting up, that was much more upfront about um, you know in in our in our publicity. Probably since we've been focusing a little bit on trading, mm -hmm. that part has sort of slipped back down the agenda a little bit. Um, we still get the odd person who'll sign up and, you know, but I think now when we do, it's, it's mostly e-newsletters as opposed to a physical newsletter that goes out. And we encourage people to subscribe, to follow us online. There's no money now. It's just, it's changed yeah. a little bit. So um, maybe that needs to be refreshed a little bit um, just because that, that body of people, um, you know, we don't have any other links with them other than they've signed up and paid yeah. five pounds. You know, that's in it. terms of the, the governance of the organisation, is that quite straightforward, you find? Yeah, we've kind of, again, created our own slightly bespoke um, model, which has been perfectly acceptable. We've always checked legally with what we're doing is correct. Um, we have a small management committee of four. Um, we then have a sort of secondary group, which we call the Wool Council, which is a slightly larger group. I think there's about eight people on it. They all of us an interest or specialism um, because our four aims are, you know, our education, crafting, cra um, sort of craft and heritage, and also the environment. I mean, these are the four sections that are part of our core aim. Um, and we've selected people who've got an interest in that. So they're not necessarily actively involved in the, the dull day to day stuff, mm -hmm. but we get them involved in doing maybe projects for us or you know, almost testing the waters in the, in the community. Um, so they'll feed back to us ideas that maybe they've been speaking to other people about. So it is a kind of next layer. And then we've got the Friends of Used Wool, which is a general membership. Right. So anybody can become a member of the Wool Council if they want to. You know, it's just if they're, it just means there's a vehicle of people who can support ideas without getting into the, you know, they're not interested in doing the finance or the, the governance as such yeah. um so that's that's kind of you know we've we had a few false starts with it i'll have to be honest um and it does take a little bit of maintenance just to make sure that dialogues are, are still happening um so that's early days for that but i think it's it's settling in a little bit mm -hmm. great perfect um how have you found the the, the impact of coronavirus um, restrictions and, and lockdown has that had a big effect on your business plan um yeah um i mean obviously like everybody we just down tool they all just down tools i i don't work here i have another business which again had to close um so i've had more time because all the staff are furloughed so i've then been able to come in and 
um, I'm able to spend, you know, a, a couple of days in, in the, at the mill every week, handling online orders, dealing with inquiries, administering the grants, because, you know, obviously all the, the resilience funding that's been available has taken a bit of time and energy to, to apply for. Um, but that's okay, you know, and, and I'm sort of now seeing a wee bit beyond that now. Um, it all seemed to be like very immediate. And now I'm seeing a part where we are beginning to sort of move back towards a time we can start production again. Yeah. Um, one of the key things is this year where you normally we take in wool clip annually, um, but we can't do this year um, because I can't guarantee when we're able to go out to collect, you know, it's going to be physically yeah. difficult to do that. We have a wool shed that's still full of raw material because we've not been able to work through it. So we need to clear that stock first before we can acquire new stock. So just in the last couple of days, I've been sending letters out to our um, wool, you know, the people we purchase wool from saying, we're not taking any of the wool clip this year. And that's, that's a hard thing to do when people have been very good at supporting us by sending out, you know, that's our local source of raw material. Um, but we just can't take it this year. So they can send it to the wool board, the British marketing, uh, wool marketing board, but it's just a bit of an interruption. And next year, I try to put a positive thing on it saying, we look forward to next year when we'll be ready to buy from you again. But it's just, but I think people are understanding of it. So um, so that's been that's been a bit of an impact. Um, obviously, we don't have any visitor season here, being in the Outer Hebrides um, and in our own sort of little bubble, because obviously with restricted travel, we've had no visitors, no tourists appearing. Um, OK, I, I know there's a little bit of change planned for July, but whether a lot of providers here are not going to be opening, yeah. you know, they've, they've, specific, they've said they're not going to open their spaces for tourist visitors because they're still a little anxious that because there's been absolutely no coronavirus um, cases in the US. Uh, would you say tourists are, are quite an important part of your, your market? A visitors are, yeah. Um, at this time of year, yes, definitely. So that's a big loss. But again, I've been able to benefit from government support I've, you know, I've applied for funding so that, you know, that, that money that I've applied for, that's our winter funding. Once staff are back in and production starts again, um, it'll take a little while to pick up. But I'm, I've kind of got that nest egg, for want of a better word, to help pay them because, you know, I'm not, we're not anywhere near what we'd normally be earning at this time of year. So, um, but I'm... The benefit is because a small organization, you can be flexible. Yeah. And I have very good staff, extremely good, who are flexible in their own life, you know, that they understand what's going on. We've been corresponding regularly about what's happening. Um, and, you know, they know and they understand the reasons why we may have to just phase in slowly to production. So, but, you know, I, they're here, I don't want to lose them. Yeah. <laughs> And they, they're desperate to get back to work, obviously, you know. Yeah. So you mentioned um, that you have web orders. Is that, do you, do you manage that through your own website or through partner websites? How, how uh, you... it's, no, it's private. It's all through our useful.com. Yeah. Um, and I have to say one of the biggest markets we have is North America. Um, I would say probably 50% of our online trade comes from customers in North America. So, and that's been extremely good over the, the, the time we've been shut. We've had really good support from that online base. Um, when people are ordering wool, they're ordering a lot of wool. You know, it's, it's like a big project as opposed mm -hmm. to one or two balls for, for a small project. So that's been fantastic, I have to say. And obviously through social media, you know, you're putting a few little stories up just to, to remind people you're there. Um, and I think probably coming into the summer season end of this month, uh, because the postal charges are increasing to the US, um, for many reasons why that is, but anyway, they're increasing. So we're probably going to do a particular campaign based on doing free, free postage for a set time just to keep people, you know, interested. So there's, there's various things we're planning on over the summer 
to keep the online audience sort of refreshed, shall we say. Yeah. Um, I think my, my final question I had noted down was, was about the sort of long term outlook for you, um, both in the context of after coronavirus and, and just generally speaking, yeah. uh, how do you see things going over the next few years? That's a big question. Um, I wish I knew. No, I mean, I, at the moment sitting here, I can sort of map out in my mind what might happen in the next 12 months. Um, I'd like, there's still some things we'd like to do on the, on the production side here. Um, we did do a bit of a, a review, a business review at the start of the year. Um, so I'll be taking some of the information that was gleaned from that review and sort of applying it um, as best I can to, to use wool. Um, as I say, I'll probably have a bit more time to spend doing that. Um, but I think I'm ready to, to sort of get back, you know, because I, I must confess, I had volunteer fatigue with the project. And that's why I sort of stepped back from doing so much day to day with them. Um, and because after 10 years, you know, you, your brain is spent you know, and I'm being very honest about that. But I feel because I've been not doing the direct work for like two years, um, I'm sort of a bit refreshed. And I feel there's, there's a few things I'd like to try and do yet. Yeah. Um, so I feel, I actually feel quite positive because I know the customers are still there. And because of the people have been based, you know, sitting at home, um, looking for things to do, if our, our craft has increased, there's an increased interest in it and making and people doing things with their hands and so um that's been a benefit for us really so i think um i'm hoping that some of our trade shows that were cancelled this year will happen next year because again that's an important part of us being out there not everybody can get there to hebrides we have to go onto the mainland and obviously be attending shows in edinburgh and, and further south so um you know, spending a bit of time focusing on that next year as well, probably. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, establishing our name as world leaders in Scottish natural wool. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, right, so I think now I will move on to my, my presentation on community shares. Um, that's probably 15, 20 minutes, and then we can come back and do a Q&A with, with all four of us panelists at the end. Um, so I will now share my screen um, and I don't think I can see the questions while I'm sharing my screen. So if anyone does have questions, put them in the, in the chat box and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Um, um, so like I said at the start, I'm, I'm Toby Sanderson, I'm from Community Share Scotland um, and we are a national support organisation for, for any groups who want to issue community shares. Um, community shares, in the simplest terms, community shares are a form of crowdfunding. Um, so I imagine you've mostly all heard of crowdfunding. Uh, Morgan mentioned earlier that I think it's been part of this week. Um, so you as an organisation are asking people who support you and, and believe in what you do to, to put their own money into your organisation to, to help you um, fundraise. Um, so community shares, the, the idea with community shares is that they're, they're more like an investment than a donation. So people put money in, but there's an expectation that eventually if the, if the business is successful, they will then get their money back. Um, and they also have, um, as shareholders, they have some influence over the organization. They can, um, they can exert some voting rights. They can stand for the management committee. They can get kind of actively involved in, in the running of things. Um, so community shares are really a, a very flexible form of finance. They can be used to fund really anything that you can convince a community of people to, to put money into. Um, so we at Community Share Scotland have worked with a lot of community pubs in, uh, community shops in, in Scotland. Um, we're starting to see more community pubs. Um, we see lots of sort of community centres and um, arts centres, that sort of thing. Um, and then you get into some quite unusual things, like there's a um, community-owned distillery in Dingwall and a community-owned harbour in, in Dumfries and Galloway. So it is really sort of open to creativity. Um, so some of the key facts about community shares, um, 
to be able to issue community shares, you have to be one of two types of organization. You have to be either a community benefit society or a cooperative society. Um, so Friends of Yes Wool is a, is a community benefit society. And I'll say a little bit more about the sort of technical aspects of that in, in the next slide. Um, another key principle is that your shareholders, the people who put money into your community share offer, uh, um, become members of your organization and they can become quite actively involved. Um, so the organization would have its um, AGM each year, its annual general meeting. Um, members would have the right to come along. They would have the right to stand for election to the management committee um, and they would have the right to elect the, the people who do stand. So they would, they would vote for people who do want to be on the committee. Um, that tends to work on a principle of one member, one vote. Um, so what that means is that regardless of how many shares a person owns, each person has a single vote in the organisation. Uh, so you could put in £100, your neighbour could put in £2,000, but you both have an equal say. Um, more money doesn't buy you a bigger voice. One of the key distinctions of community shares against shares as you might know them in private companies is that they are what's called withdrawable shares. Um, what that means is that somebody would purchase a share from the organization, um, say they bought hundred pound of shares. They cannot sell that share on, they can't transfer it to anyone else. They can't make a profit on the share. All they can do is hold that share for a given period of usually at least three years, after which they can withdraw it from the organization. Um, so they would go back to the organization and they would get back what they paid for the share. Um, there is the potential to offer interest on, on shares. Um, so some, some community benefit societies offer interest of say two, three, sometimes up to 5%. Um, and that's to incentivize people to, to invest. But really the main impetus for community share offers and community benefit societies is for um, pro projects with a social purpose. It's, it's not about getting people rich quickly. It's not about making huge amounts of money. It's more about people, things that are doing good in the community. Um, and the, the interest that's payable is more of a, a business expense to attract investment rather than to really um, make huge amounts of money. Um, one of the huge benefits of community shares is that it's a really good way to attract further funding. Um, a lot of grant funders in, in Scotland and across the UK look really favourably on community share offers um, because it demonstrates that your community believe in what you're doing and that they support you. Um, so quite a lot of the projects that we work with use community shares as really the last piece of the jigsaw in a much bigger funding package. Um, in some cases it's as low as 5 or 10 percent of, of the overall money that they need. Um, so what is a community benefit society? Uh, community benefit societies are a specific legal structure, a specific, specific form of governance for community organisations. Um, they are registered with the Financial Conduct Authority um, and they're governed by what are called model rules, which are very similar to the sort of articles of association of, of other types of um, organisation, of say companies. Um, but you tend to get these from relevant sponsoring bodies in your sector. So you would go to a sponsoring body, get a set of model rules, which are essentially like a template that you put your information into and you send it off to the, the FCA to be registered. Um, that process takes a little bit longer than setting up a company. Um, it's probably the, the FCA estimate up to 15 days to, to register a society. Uh, and there's some fees involved of probably up to around 500 pounds, but it's, it's a reasonably straightforward process. Um, community benefit societies can be can be charitable in Scotland, so you, you can achieve charitable status as a community benefit society. Um, they're also they're named in the the Scottish Community Empowerment Bill, so they 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 really offer you all the same rights and protections that the other forms of governance offer you. Um, they are compatible with things like community asset transfer. They are compatible with things like community right to buy. So really anything you can do with a with a company or a, a community, community interest company, you can also do with a society. Um, there are also options to, if you have an existing organization set up, say for example, you're already set up as a, a community a company limited by guarantee, there are options there to connect a society to your existing organization. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail on that on that now. That's something that our support can look at with you if it's if it's something that's important to you. But it does mean that if you have an existing organisation, you can have agreements in place about sharing profits and and sharing some level of influence between the two. Um, so from here, I've just got a few case studies of, of how some other communities have used community shares in the past. Um, so my first one here is, is Bridgehen Farmhouse in uh, the south side of Edinburgh. And this is a community who took on a, a formerly derelict farmhouse in Edinburgh. Um, they now have this building set up and running with a, a community cafe. They have a, a training kitchen for, for vulnerable adults. They have various workshop spaces, um, including a, a bike repair hub and a, a wood crafting hub. Um, and currently they're, they're doing a lot of um, community resilience for, for coronavirus restrictions. Um, they're, they're doing lots of food deliveries, they're doing lots of shopping for vulnerable people and things like that. Um, so there is £70,000 in, in community shares. And I think this is one of the examples of a, of a group I mentioned who community shares were not a huge part of their funding package. I think overall this project probably cost about £2 million. Um, and it included funding from the likes of the National Lottery and the Robertson Trust. But for them, it was really important to, to build a sense of community involvement. So all their shareholders are now active members of their community. And um, they have over 400 shareholders who, you know, now are part of this, this society and have a sense of ownership of this building, um, rather than it being something that's been sort of put in place for them by, by local authority or, or some other sort of distant organisation. Um, so it's something they can actually have some sense of ownership over. Um, my next case study is a, a music venue in Bristol. Um, so this is the exchange in Bristol who were originally set up as a, a community interest company by three friends who, who just wanted to set up a music venue. It took off, it was a big success and they, they wanted to move into bigger premises. So to help fund the move into bigger premises, they um, uh, transferred from a community interest company to a community benefit society and they issued community shares and they raised um, just under 300,000 with community shares. Um, and they're able to offer their, their shareholders 3% interest on, on those shares. Um, so you'll see that photo there. It's, I think it's a four-story building. Um, so that ground floor is a bar and cafe. The, the basement is a, is a music venue. The upstairs, um, there's a, a recording studio and a, a record shop. So really quite a comprehensive music business um, and, and doing really well for itself. Um, and my next and final case study is um, Comedia Theatre in Bath. This is a historic theatre in Bath. I think it's the building is, is the first theatre that was built in the in the southwest of England. Um, and again, the community raised almost at four hundred thousand pound in community shares to, to take this on. So they now they don't own the building, but they have a, a peppercorn lease from the local authority to to manage it and look after it. Um, and they're a community benefit society, but they, they partner with a private company, Comedia, who, who also have a venue in Bristol. So through that partnership, they have access to Comedia's um, booking team and their, their marketing and their branding. Um, so they, they have long term ambitions to own this building. Uh, it's valued at one and a half million. So that, you know, they're trying to find money to, to take ownership of it and fully redevelop it. Um, but, so it's a, a theatre that runs comedy events, music events, theatre and, and also a cinema and gallery in that space. So Community Share Scotland, um, we are set up um, with funding from the Scottish Government and the National Lottery. Um, just now we're funded until March 2021. We're, we're in the process of bidding for, for an extension to that funding. We hope to be around for at least another three years. Um, and we exist to raise awareness of community shares, to help people understand what community shares are, but also to offer really hands-on support and guidance for, for groups who want to issue community shares. Um, so we have a team of three people based here in Edinburgh, covering the whole of Scotland. We do this sort of early stage support as a team. So our, our team would work with you um, to help you work out if community shares are a good option for you, help you understand how it all works, what's involved, um, what, what you need to do. And if we together both decide that community shares are a good viable option for you, we can then bring in funded consultancy support. 
Um, so we can fund up to six days of consultancy, working with a, an expert in community shares who can help you to really hash out the detail of, of how you would do this. Um, so that would tend to focus on, on four key areas. We would look at your business plan. Um, we wouldn't work with you from having no business plan to having a completely finished bells and whistles uh, business plan, but we would take you from having a fairly mature idea of what you were doing um, into working through the community shares element of that. We could work with you on community engagement, so thinking about um, who might who might buy shares in this, how you might how you might speak to them, how you might reach those people. Um, we would look at your governance with you, so helping you to register your society, helping you to get appropriate board members in place, that sort of thing. Um, and ultimately, all that comes together into your, your share offer document, which is the, the document that goes out to your community and, and gives them the information they need to decide whether or not to invest. Um, we can also offer a grant of up to £5,000. Um, that is to help promote share offers. So any sort of marketing costs, uh, advertising costs, um, design and print of share offer documents, things like that can be, be covered by that grant. Um, and finally, we, we have good links with our other organisations. So a big part of what we do is, is signposting people to other support that's available. Um, so we kind of encourage people to get in touch with us as soon as you're thinking about community shares, whether it's you know something you plan to do imminently or not. If you come and speak to us, we can help you work out what you need to do and, and who else you might need to speak to to get the best support. Um, and final point on that slide, maybe the most important one for, for a lot of organisations, is that everything we do is, is fully funded, so it comes at no cost um, to you as an organisation. So that is really my very quick fly through intro to community shares. Um, it is very basic intro, so I mean, if anyone's interested to learn more, please do ask questions here. Um, I'm also happy for you to, to get in touch with me and, and we, can, we can speak about sort of specific cases um, as well. Um, I think there's one question in there. So question from uh, Karen, um, how often do you see people withdrawing their shares? Is it a common or uncommon practice? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, it, it varies depending on, on the type of project. So I think we tend to work with a real spectrum of projects. On, on one end, you have the more sort of commercial projects that have more financial payouts of so things like renewable energy schemes, things like the distillery in Dingwall. Uh, and then on the other end, you have the likes of Bridge End and the others that are very sort of socially driven and, and more about doing something good in the community. Um, and I think in the in the commercial side and the re renewable energy side, that sort of thing, you do tend to see withdrawals. I think you, you tend to see more people who put the money in because it, it is a little bit of a good investment um, and they do expect to see the money back. Whereas in other projects, people do sometimes treat it as more of a donation. Um, and they do sometimes, you know, especially when someone's put in a small amount of money, if they've put in say 25, 50 pounds, by the time they're allowed to withdraw it, in, in a lot of cases, they've forgotten they ever did it and, and they don't actually ask for it back. Any more questions? I wonder if I might ask Dana a question. Um, just uh, on, you obviously focused on, well, can you say raw product in terms of yarn and um, woven material, but you've got, you see, you, you're obviously working with designer makers as partners. Are, are some of them employees or do you have contracts with other designers? How does that work and, and are they still are they still are you still supplying them we tend to you know we don't have a, a large amount there's only a few people we would work with because the, the volume of um say for example we do a weaving commission it's it's maybe only going to be for about 20 meters of cloth these are not big amounts but for example we use one Hannes tweed weaver she happens to be the one who's the closest to us geographically because we can send the yarn over on the ferry and she can pick it up and she's only about five minutes drive from where the ferry comes in. So it's a very handy supply chain. We just send it over, she picks it up, she weaves it and then she gets it finished and then it's shipped back to us on the ferry. We can go and pick it up. So it's very small scale. 
but it's a handmade product. And then we use that cloth to commission. Um, we use a company in Edinburgh, Calopsia, who manufacture um, you know, small batches of finished items, little bags and things like that. So, um, and that works well for us because we're not, we don't produce a lot. So it's, we, you know, it's, it suits the scale of our operation. Um, I was considering doing commissioning some tweed for our, the weaver we used, but she's a self-employed person. All have us tweed weavers are self-employed. Um, so, and, and we probably set, sent her some yarn off over the summer to get some, some cloth woven up. Uh, we use another weaver who's on the northeast of Scotland, but she's a very specialised weaver, um, woven in the bone. Um, she's probably one of the best handloom weavers in Scotland. Um, and it's a very specific yarn we send her to, to work with because, again, she takes care and she designs pattern for us. And these are for um, apparel, scarves and wraps. Um, we use another mill um, in Mull at Ardalanish for doing blankets. So, but again, these are very specific small commissions. Um, but we try and keep all that within Scotland as, as much as we can. Um, there's nobody in Uist who's weaving at all, not on a commercial sense. So we have to sort of go a wee bit further afield for that. But we have picked the people correctly because of the skill they have, you know. Yeah. Um, so we'll probably start commissioning again, certainly over the summer. Um, but again, because we, we like to sort of use up the stock we have. So we'll be commissioning summer late summer into autumn, I think, ready for next year. So. And those bespoke products that are through those kind of unique commissions, are they only sold through the, 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 yeah. your website? So no, no other yeah. third, third party websites? Yeah. We, don't, we don't wholesale to any others for that. Because again, we don't produce the, the you know, the markup we'd have to put on that. It's yeah. just not gonna work. So, um, and it's only a very small part of our offer. Um, and we like to sort of keep control. It's, it's you know, we, we wanting to increase our own um, products based on that, but it's the economy of scale and at the moment. It's, well, the, 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 so you're so unique then, there's such a, a provenance and uh, I mean, that, that in terms of that quality and the, and the kind of background and the community aspect, so strong. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another question into the Q&A. Mary's asked, um, for a large scale project looking for a property, um, looking for a house with accommodation and about 10 acres of land, private purchases are expensive. Do the panel have any thoughts on finding suitable property to set up a community, a community asset? Um, so I think from my perspective, I think it'd be worth speaking to the Community Ownership Support Service. Um, who are, a, a, again, a similar body to ourselves, set up with Scottish Government money to help groups with the process of, of community asset transfer. So that is where a community group takes ownership of an asset from a, from a public authority, such as a, a council or a, um, NHS or anything like that. Um, so they might be able to help you identify um, properties like that in your, in your area. It's also worth looking at the Scottish Land Fund, who um, fund the purchase of, of land and buildings. Um, they can fund up to 95% of, of the purchase cost, which can really help. Um, we've, we've worked with quite a lot of groups who've, who've used community shares alongside a, a Scottish Land Fund um, grant. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kieran, would you? I suppose this could also help. With... Yeah, well, in terms of um, uh, purchasing assets, we usually work with social banks um, to provide um, the last bit of finance. So quite often we work with um, Triodos or Calf Bank or someone someone like that. Um, and they normally will uh, provide the lion's share of the, the money for an asset transfer. Um, and they take the um, the major security over the, the asset. And then we'll come in um, later and, and um, add the, the final part. But in terms of actually um, sourcing them, I think those are the, the kind of best suggestions. Um, so be also, I think what we will probably see um, coming out of COVID is that there's quite a lot of um, community uh, assets that local authorities and, uh, well, local authorities in particular, will probably be quite keen to um, work with the community to transfer. Um, to because we're all obviously we're buying quite a lot online at the moment, 
and um, we're doing more uh, working from home. So I think there's going to be um, a focus on properties um, and making better use of them. Yeah, and, and Peter in the chat has also suggested the, the buildings at risk register, which is another good suggestion. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So I don't know if there's any more questions. We're kind of like um, coming up to quite neatly on the hour and a half. Good timing. Um, if there's not any more coming through, then um, we'll just say thank you. Thank you very much to Dana. Thank you to Toby. And thank you also to, to Morgan. Um, one thing which I'll, I'll just um, kind of mention, um, anyone that's attended this, um, Thank you very much. Anyone that's attended the, the past three days or the sessions we've had um, running prior to the, the digital sessions, we've got a small grant pot um, called the Assist uh, Grant Pot, which um, is basically up to £5,000 for um, support to do a bit of consultancy. Maybe you need a, a survey done, something like that, that might um, help you get to a point to become um, investment ready. So in the instance of um, someone looking for an asset transfer, um, obviously you would probably need to get a survey done or you might be looking at a business plan, a bit of consultancy work. So this specific grant pot is for those sort of um, consultancy costs. Um, so we're going to email you out uh, tomorrow um, the details of that grant fund, the application, which is quite short, it's online. And if you're interested, um, you can drop us a line. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, I thank you to, to everyone. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, thanks to all, all the panellists. Um, so hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Dana. Thanks for... Um, <laughs> nice to meet you, Dana. Good to see you, Toby, and, and thanks, Kieran. Um, and, and cheers, all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.